Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome Pamela Stevenson. Good afternoon. How are you all? <laughs> Thank you for coming. Wonderful to be in a room of readers. It's a, a true pleasure. Your, your parents were pretty remarkable people. Uh, yes. They became a cancer research duo. Mm. Um, you, you, your father had a sense of humour, which uh, I think you inherited. Um, maybe. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> As a teenager, you had a pretty awful time, uh, which culminated in you being uh, thrown out of the family home at a very early age. I, I didn't really want to tell this story in, in the book. This is my, my seventh book. And, and I sort of, when I was asked to write my memoirs, I thought it would be really, really fun to sort of write something light and frothy and lots of showbiz stories and drop a few names and make up some stuff. That's why I called it The Varnished Untruth. Um, but actually, as I was writing it, I found I was rather blocked about that. I found mm. it really hard. You know, the sort of conscious part of our brains are not necessarily um, where, where we write from. In fact, if, if that um, prefrontal cortex is too involved in the writing process, nothing really good happens. So there was another part of me that wanted to write this story. And um, in the end, I sort of had to let that voice be heard, it was a, a more wounded child sort of self, one who, yeah, one who'd had a lot of problems, who'd been very, very anxious as a child. And that, um, and that part of me was, was wanting to tell a story that I didn't want to tell. But then I sort of tricked myself into allowing that voice to, to be out on paper. So the end result is kind of a, um, it's a conversation with myself, almost a therapy session. At times, I've got a great friend in in London. You probably know her, Kathy Lett, the novelist. And, well, Kathy's always saying, "Oh, Pam, you need to book a session with yourself." <laughs> <laughs> and she says that stuff when I do something remarkably stupid, which is really often. Um, <laughs> and then finally, I thought, well, that's, maybe that's how I'm going to approach this. This, this memoir, I'm going to have right. a, a long session with myself and come to some, some conclusions. So it's kind of a journey, because I found that there's lots of anger still left in me about things that happened when I was little. And, and you know, looking back at, at my, my childhood in Sydney, um, you know, wonderful things, but also some really challenging things. And um, I just sort of let it all out. Um, I don't know if there's anyone in the audience who, who's had that experience, but I was actually disowned by my father. Um, and it happened as a result of a very unpleasant experience that happened partly because I, I courted it, but also, you know, it was, it was something very wrong that an older person did. I guess you, you gain a, a very deep sense of unworthiness and it, it really stays with you and it's there underneath anything good that happens or anything good that you do um, is always mitigated by, well, but do I really, de do I really deserve to be successful at this? Do I really deserve to have um, any, any happiness? Do I deserve to have a good relationship? I mean, all of these kinds of things. And, you know, to be honest, all the things that I've, I've, I've gone through in my life, though, have, have only helped me um, be capable of understanding those things in other people in my work as a psychotherapist. And I think they also um, helped to motivate me to do well. Uh, because I wanted, I was very motivated to prove that I was worth something. Not the nine o'clock news. Um, you were the only woman in a very uh, Oxbridge educated bloke sort of program. I didn't even know what Oxbridge was. I thought Oxbridge was an actual university. <laughs> <laughs> but, I was uh, so dumb. I mean, I just had no uh, idea. Uh, you uh, went to Sarah Ferguson's hen night with uh, Diana, Princess of Wales. Billy was invited to this Andrew Stag night and, and I discovered that nothing was being done for Sarah. And I had these wigs because I was performing stage, I was doing my one woman show. So I put Diana in my Joan Collins wig and Sarah in the wig that I used as the wife of the Archbishop of Canterbury. We all went out into the town. It was just a regular girls night out. Just us and the whole of MI5. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I had a lot of fun when I was a kid, and I certainly didn't as a young adult. I was always very, very busy. So now, you know, dancing has become this huge passion, and it's become that and diving have become 
the ways in which I relax, the ways in which I, I relax my, my anxiety. It's been lovely. Be on British TV when you were on uh, Strictly Come Dancing, which is their version of uh, Dancing with the Stars. Oh no, it was amazing. I, I have a lot of time for professional dancers. I think they're amazing. They, they're capable of shaking hands one second and grinding hips with you the next. And it was a lovely experience. And, and also because I gave up dancing, I gave up ballet when I was in my teens and I shouldn't have, because it would have been wonderful to have kept that going my whole life. And actually I was asked to do the one here, but I bet it was too early for me to do it. And then they asked me to do the UK one and, and, um, and I said yes. And I ever thought I'd last three weeks and my husband said, don't even think about it. You'll make a total arse of yourself. <laughs> And uh, that very nearly happened. But anyway, it was, it was wonderful and I've continued to dance ever since.